I don't know about everybody else out there, but I feel like every conversation that I have with people, especially one-on-one since the pandemic, just has like a whole new level of um, realness and potentially depth. And I feel like this conversation with Garland Fielder, who's an artist out of Houston, Texas, is a really great example of that. Um, We didn't know each other. We'd followed each other on Instagram for a few years and really hadn't even interacted that much on there. But, um, you know, I think we both have started new bodies of work recently that the other was taking note of and um he had reached out to me uh to invite me for a studio visit like right around the time that I was pushing go on this project and because we're in different cities that wasn't going to work out but I you know in exchange um invited him to do one of these talks and we go from not really knowing each other at all to talking about mortality and, um, you know, life on a grand scale. (laughs) There's just like, there's all of these really big, um, ontological, uh, explorations in his work. And I think in my work in different ways, And, um, I just, I really appreciate someone who can have those kinds of conversations about the depths and, and the vastness and, um, it's not everybody's cup of tea and that's fine. Um, but, uh, for those of you who do like to go there, I think you might enjoy this. This conversation has some really, really interesting um, connections with the previous one with Scott Winterode. Uh, the first, well, actually both the the main conversation with him and the bonus video that I did um, in this whole theme of like um, how events that that are catastrophic or devastating, can can have this effect of uh, inspiration and awe and um, you know feeling the the largeness of everything that is and your place in that and um, what's even more fascinating to me is that um, he, I had actually planned to have him, his talk appear later and, um, somebody had had to postpone because of some things that came up. And so I bumped him up and it worked out with his schedule and, um, it feels kind of like it was the right thing just because this flows so almost seamlessly from the previous talks and um so if you enjoyed the last two then then know that we're just gonna unpack some of those same themes but from a different angle and uh, which is honestly what we're all kind of doing um yeah so let's get in there Let's get in there. I think that's a good intro. I'm not very good at the intros. I don't... I feel a little, a little intros. Blech. Let's just do this. <laughs> I first discovered your work at the very beginning of the lockdown period in the pandemic during... Um, Glass Tire was doing those five-minute video tours. Do you remember they were doing that? And they were one of the people featured. and And they were showing your... Your, or you were showing your bunker series mm. so that was the first time I discovered your work and that particular body of work just felt so um appropriate for the time <laughs> and almost like prescient um and then just really I mean I I listened to the video and uh 
a lot of what you were saying was really resonating with me. So I've enjoyed continuing to follow you since then. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about that particular series and just kind of introduce like what, what it is and what you were thinking? Absolutely. Uh, thank you, by the way. Uh, I really appreciate that. Um, so the, the bunker series, um, I got interested in that, um, type of architecture, uh, when I was studying, uh, architecture at the university of Texas in Austin, uh, I got a master's there in 2015. So around 2013, I discovered this guy named Paul Virilio. He's a, a French, um, theoretician more than an architect. But he was really fascinated with the um, concrete bunkers that were left on the north, um, the coast of, of Europe, built by the French and the Germans and the English. But these um, gigantic bunkers, these these fortifications had um, over the 20 or 30 or 40 years since the war had sort of become unmoored and they had become tilted and, and sort of um, imbalanced, I guess, on the beachhead fronts. And he was really interested in the way that those became sort of sculptural objects that um, took this sort of snapshot in time and then became something different, right? And um, I really, I was really turned on by that because um, on the one hand, it, it speaks to sort of an, uh, the objectness of architecture. Sometimes that's not really very popular where I studied, but um, I think invariably when people think of, of good architecture, there's a certain sort of, um, objectness to it you know there's a, there's something different about a building that's very special and unique from other buildings and bunkers seem to employ that strongly they also seem to um, really speak to the modernist uh, trope that um, form follows function you know I think that was Lewis Sullivan who said that and the way that bunkers look and the why the reason why they look the way they look is specifically because of um, survival right they're, they're shaped the way they are so they deflect bombs and they're 12 foot thick concrete walls so they deflect any sort of shrapnel um i just really like the the functional aspect of them and it also seemed to as you mentioned before seemed to be a nice um dovetail into the mindset of the quarantine and the pandemic in general uh it seemed as though we were all kind of scared of this abstract concept you know, and um, I mean, it's not abstract if you get COVID, but you can't see it, you know, mm -hmm. so there's a lot of sort of um, ambiguity as to what's going to keep you safe, what's not going to keep you safe, what's uh, all that kind of thing. And um, the notion of bunkers seem to seem to um, talk to that. Uh, I, I Since I, I sort of, I haven't been drawing a whole lot of bunkers as such lately. Um, I've sort of taken that body of work and, and developed it into sort of exploring um, cataclysmic events that would get people to seek the shelter of bunkers. I've kind of added that as another uh, ingredient into the visual stew. Um, so I, I recently made a painting of, um, uh, what was this, 60 mile um, uh, asteroid. It has to be. I think a planet ending asteroid needs to be something like 60 miles in diameter and and that would just finish the planet of all life completely uh, stuff like that I, I find it um i find it inspiring instead of uh depressing to think of these events that could happen like a super volcano is another example of um of a, of a, of a, a life ending event on the planet um I, I don't know. It's almost like we think of these things in terms of religion rather than reality, but they are a reality. And I find that interesting. I think a lot of people would, would automatically just go into fear mode when thinking about a planet ending asteroid or super volcano or something like that. And um, it's interesting. I'm finding that with these, these videos that um some of the themes are kind of building on each other and i know you haven't had the advantage of of hearing the conversation that i just had recently with scott winroad that one's going to be coming out soon but um we we actually talked about similar themes and hmm. um, 
and I, you know, that we just barely touched on that, the idea of, um, how, how some of these things that are cataclysmic, um, can, can have that kind of like inspirational feel. And that's an, I mean, it's an interesting word choice that you made there. So I'm, I'm wondering if you can kind of expand on that particular word and that feeling for you. Uh, sure. Yeah. I, hmm. so I think there's something, uh, interesting about, um, as a person, when I think of, uh, well, this would be a long way of, of, of getting around it, but so I have, I have a friend of mine or a close friend of mine, uh, is a musician and he's a really good musician that he, um, unfortunately he's going through the later stages of, uh, Lou Gehrig's disease right now. Mm -hmm. And so he's unable to, he can't even feed himself anymore. You know, he can barely breathe without a machine, but just as, as recently as, um, two, two and a half years ago, he was able to play the piano better than I've ever seen anybody in person. I mean, just absolutely virtuoso. virtuoso. And so uh, in one sense, um, the reason I bring that up is that um, any event that that is uh, is sort of life-ending or life-altering is it, it can be understood as cataclysmic. It doesn't have to be um, universally shared by everyone else. So I think my attitude is that when we're um, contemplating our own mortality on an individual level, uh, the proper response to that or the proper etiquette to do that with is one of empathy and one that um, extends your fear of that or your horror of that, it extends it to other people so that we can share and we can help each other get through whatever the calamity might be. So I try to go and see my friend once in a while and, and just be with him. Um, and in a sense, that's all we would do. If, if like, I mean, I don't know, like I'm a big fan of the, the film Melancholia by Lars von Trier. And in it, there's this, this, this planet ending um, comet or, or meteorite or whatever asteroid come into the planet. And the movie's all about how different people either share in that experience or they don't share in that experience. Right. And so I think what's powerful about the symbol of a bunker or the symbol of a collective destroying event is that it does have at least the temporary power of bringing people closer together. I find that fascinating because we're all in the end completely um, incapable of stopping the calamity that's going to stop each and every one of us. Right. I mean, we're all going to die <laughs> and yeah. we all know that. And we all live our lives as though we're not going to, because that's just how we have to get on with it. We can't just sit around bemoaning the fact that we're going to die every day. You know what I mean? Life doesn't get lived that way. So implicit in our existence is this sort of denial. And I think it's the mark of a, um, a mature person, I guess, that can understand that and figure out a way to put that into a language that shares the commonality of it with us. You know what I'm saying? I think in the, at the end of the day, what we really want as human beings is to connect with other human beings. And when we're faced with something like a pandemic or a quarantine, it sort of um, is, is hugely upsetting uh, for reasons that maybe we don't even understand at the time but i think upon reflection and what i've tried to kind of put into my artwork since going through all that is that there is this collective understanding um albeit maybe unspoken of of you know non-existence um and and what that what that is i mean we can't i don't i don't even think i can con conceive of, of what it means you know what i mean to 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 understand non-existence is to share in it. And we don't do that as living creatures. So we're kind of behind the eight ball on, on how it all works. Um, yeah, maybe that's well, long winded, but maybe that's something in that. I've had some other conversations recently um, just talking about, you know, the level of division and animosity and vitriol that 
exists out there and what what does it take to get people to actually come together and help each other out you know does it does it really take something that cataclysmic and or does that end up dividing people further you know i mean they're thing it's things that i think we're seeing play out i think it's perversely as as the closer we get to the actualization of a of a cataclysmic event the the more effective it is at a bonding building experience do you, do you know what i mean um it's 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 like things have to get really bad <laughs> yeah um yeah i remember talking to, with my father who was um uh, he studied history in, in college and i remember talking to him about um the depression and what the country was going through and all that and he was always um adamant that it was it was actually world war ii that brought us out of the world depression and his point was kind of all the prosperity that America has has en enjoyed since 1945 was a result directly of a world war. And that just pops into my head, you know, it's like, what a shame that we have to, we have to go to the brink to, uh, to realize our potential, maybe, you know what I mean? Or to appreciate, uh, but I just, I don't know. I think that's, um, that's human nature, to be honest with you. I, I don't, so much of, of, of my life has been lived uh, not examining enough, you know, without thinking and just sort of reacting. And I think it takes, uh, it takes, you have to go through things, you know, you have to experience uh, trauma to really appreciate what you have. I think that's just, that's the way it's been for me. Um, uh, maybe, I, you know, I can only speak for myself, but um Certainly in America, our value system seems to be, uh, well, I'll put it this way. It seems like our value system is, is, is geared towards the short term rather than the long term. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and uh, everybody's just trying to get through their day, you know. Yeah. Or, and, and there's no fault to that. There's, there's no fault no to fault that, of that. course. And, right? and if you're comfortable, then why why change? Why mess up a yeah. good thing? Even if yeah. the comfort comes at the expense of a lot of other things that may be unseen at the surface level, you know? Yeah. Uh, or un unrecognized, you know what I mean? Yeah. Un yeah. Uh, yeah unrecognized would be the word for it. I, it's scary to recognize these things. Do you know what I mean? It's scary to it's scary for me to go see my friend that's got, got ALS. It's, it's scary because I see my own demise in that, you know, we see our own failure. We see the own, our own biological failure when we're confronted with it in other people. And that's, that's terrifying. I mean, to just people being around the poor fellow, not let alone him, of course, could have to go through the horror show. So it's, it's a hard thing. Um, but it's a worthy thing, you know what I mean? It's it's um, it, it's something that that directly adds value to our existence. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So the the series that you're working on now, the cataclysms are these are um, imagined possible events. They're not actual events that have occurred. Yeah, yeah, yeah they're imagined possible events. Um, I'm I'm trying to keep things in a sort of abstract, uh, not too much of a literal bent. Uh, the last two paintings I did are, are pretty straightforward. They're 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 done in a fairly abstracted manner, but they're they're pretty straightforward. So um, I'm also I don't know I'm playing a lot of music these days, and I think that um, sometimes the type of uh, creations that happen in that genre are somehow a little bit more um, directly involving uh, what I'm talking about here. Uh, but that's another can of worms. Um, you know, a, a musical expression, I don't, I don't have lyrics in, in what we do. And it's um, oftentimes it's about building anticipation and building uh, expectation and then figuring out where that leads 
that leads the, the particular performance. And um, that's kind of another way of getting at, uh, number one, bonding with other people, but also um, confronting something that's that's almost unknowable. You know, um, again, I think that um, if we were con if we're to contemplate our own non-existence, it's 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 almost an unknowable kind of realm. I mean, we know it's going to happen, but you know what I mean. Nobody believes dying is like just going to sleep. I mean, we know it's different. We know that it's a disintegration of our corporal self, and uh, that just opens up such a um, such a weird mental space to exist in you know what i mean um yeah i don't know i don't i don't i don't i don't find it uh, macabre or, or or depressing i just find it kind of fascinating um i'm getting more and more interested in uh concepts of reincarnation as well during all this research and i'm kind of thinking about um time scales involved in the universe and the expansion of the universe and the distance and all that kind of stuff. And I don't know, I had this idea where um, time isn't really experienced unless you're, unless you're there to experience it. You know what I mean? We don't have a concept of time before we were born. Um, we have a sort of a concept of when we die, we're dead forever, but I don't know. I think that, um, the numbers and the time and the space and all that involved in the in the in the universe is just um i find it hopeful <laughs> in yeah. a way uh that all yeah. this could happen again and again and again in different variations and yeah that might be billions of years in between but what is the, that that's nothing if you're not there to experience it you, you know what i mean i don't know just stupid no, thoughts i like do that. and, and again, like I said, <laughs> there's very similar themes going on um in some of the the previous talks so uh it's going to be cool to see how these build on each other but um yeah yeah with that that yeah, I, i'm looking forward of, to it. of deep time and uh, um the cycles of life at a very grand scale you know, like, like species wide, and then there's the different eras that have existed on our planet. And then our planet is only one planet. So, you know, there's, it's, it's going on everywhere. Um, yeah. It's fascinating. And it is like, um, this really beautiful sort of life persisting, you know, um, yeah, despite all the odds, right? Yeah, yeah. The last drawing I made was of uh, Enrico Fermi. I got really interested in the Fermi paradox. and, and uh -huh. uh, I have a, that's funny, I, I have a townhouse in Montrose and my neighbor is a, uh, she's an astronaut. You know, mm -hmm. she's like, went up to the space station and spent six months there. I think she's a biologist or something, but... One day she was walking her dog and uh, in the neighborhood and I went up and introduced myself and talked to her and I asked her what she thought of the Fermi paradox. And she kind of looked at me like I was crazy, you know, almost like she didn't know what I was talking about. And then she's like, oh yeah, I heard of that. And then she just kind of explained to me, well, when I'm up there, I'm, I'm working, you know, I'm, I'm doing experiments and shit. I don't have time to just sit around scratching my head thinking about the Fermi paradox. Right. I don't know. I got to tell you, I was really disappointed by that answer. Um, it, it's kind of funny that way, but. Um, but that's very yeah, I mean, typical of like other, you know, people that I've, I, I mean, I have followed the space program forever. I'm a big fan of all of that. And it's yeah. that's a very standard astronaut kind of response. It's like, look, we got a yeah. job to do. If we don't do the job right, we're going to die you know yeah. so yeah yeah it's, complications beyond what i can comprehend but but it seems to me it also kind of a nice little nutshell of, of humanity in and of itself it's like we get busy with the, the stuff we have to do to stay alive and the bigger picture is kind of those are for other people that that yeah. have more leisure time to those are for artists but certainly Enri enrico fermi was was no person of leisure so um 
I don't know. I think it's a relevant question. I think it's kind of baffling when you break it down. Um, so just, but just another, put it in mm -hmm. context really quick, because I know there's going to be people listening who don't really know what that that is. Um, can you? Oh, it? yeah. I would. Sure. Well, so he he was a physicist uh, on the Manhattan Project, and he was sitting around having lunch with some fellow physicists. And um, UFOlogy, I guess, was kind of a new thing. And um, coupled with our ability to see further and further into space, and they were talking about the, I guess, the odds of um, alien existence or extraterrestrial uh, life. And they thought, well, the the universe is 13.8 billion years old, and um, this is how big it is. This is where we are. This is what we can see. And then Fermi just kind of said, well, where is everybody? And they all knew that it's like, well, yeah, given the data that we have, and we know that we are here, right? We know life is possible because we're it. You know, where is, how come there's no, I mean, there's something like 400 billion other um, solar systems in the Milky Way, something like that. You know, the odds that we are the only complex life, it just seems ridiculous. But yet we see, we look around and we see absolutely no evidence of anything designed. You know what I mean? It's all just natural black holes and quarks and all, I don't know, whatever, anything that's not designed. So I don't know, it's really strange. Uh, I know there's physicists that think, yeah, it's, it's so complex and it's so rare that this, we are the only complex life in the universe and i find that really interesting because that turns the whole th then we become anthropocentric again you know what i mean it's like man does become the center of the universe again if, if we are the only, i don't know it's it's i find it interesting um and then that led me to another quote that i read the other day that said human beings are the universe's expression of wanting to observe itself and i thought that was really hopeful you know i for some reason that really turned me on um I don't know, you know, you read about it. It's like, well, if, if we do see evidence of, of aliens, that's terrifying because anytime two, two, two um, organized living things come together, the one that the superior technology decimates the other one. I mean, that's just kind of the way it's worked on this planet. So I don't know how happy we would be to see um, a race of superior aliens headed our way. You know, that might be... That not not be so great. It's a frame of reference from from our point of view, you know, having no idea what frame of res reference, like any any other species, if there's alien species visiting, like what they're coming from, you know. It's bound to involve resources, though. You know what I mean. Uh... Well, I mean, one would assume physics is the same on different planets, like gravity and molecular biology is similar. And for life to to expand, it needs resources. And it seems like that would be the reason. I'm, I'm obviously a, a, a very uh, newbie to all this and uh, a lay person when it comes to um, astrophysics. But um, I don't know. I, I, I find it very fascinating. Um, some other, uh, another direction, I haven't made these drawings yet, but I found a really beautiful drawing of, uh, I mean, a beautiful image of uh, Typhoid Mary. And I was gonna make a nice drawing of Typhoid Mary because I, I think there's a very similar uh, thing happening. I, I did a little research on her and she was this harbinger of, uh, she was asymptomatic of typhoid fever and she didn't believe she had it, but she was sp clearly spreading it to anyone that she came in contact with. And I just find that kind of, uh, I don't know, there's something there. I'm not sure what it is, you know. Um, if we think of thoughts and ideas as um, viral, then, uh, you know, that's pretty powerful stuff, too. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> for the better or for the worse. I, mean, I feel like we can just look at the world and see evidence of how thoughts and ideas have viral yeah. impact. Um, for better and yeah. for worse, you know. And then, and then sometimes I wonder, are, as humans, are we just sort of tools being used for, say, I don't know, technology, you know, to get to a certain point where it becomes this sort of thing that starts to evolve in a more 
directed way than, than the human species. I don't know. It's pretty wild. There's so many different yeah. tangents that, that it yeah, can go. Absolutely. You know? I got to absorb a little bit of that. <laughs> Big stuff. Um, just to go back to, you know, we're in such an infancy period of our understanding of the rest of the universe, you know, and um, I mean, we, we've barely, barely glimpsed anything that's out there um, yeah. but we have the telescopes that we we do <clears throat> are just looking at such a tiny little slice of what's yeah. available you know from from the vantage point of the time where we are and so you know we're looking yeah backwards at events that have happened um it, and I just, yeah, I just feel like a lot of those questions while um, I absolutely love going there and exploring them and I find them to be worthwhile and um, I feel like it's important to remember that we just, there's so much we don't know and that we don't have the capacity to know right now because of mm. either we don't have the available tools or perhaps just as a species, our ability to comprehend, um, you know, what might be very complicated physics, like our brains just can't do it in the same way that a frog can't do math, you know, it's just like, what's our, yeah. what's our capacity and, and, and leaving space for that, you know, that's kind of where I always come to is like this, where, where are we, what is our understanding right now? And not having like the, the hubris to, to assume that we, we have those kinds of answers, you know, um, or that maybe we're even pointed in the right direction. Um, yeah, or, or what scares me is to realize that the the answers that we do come up with, these are all just thoughts, you know what I mean? These are, I mean, any meaning that, that we construe is, is construed in our heads. And I think that it's easy to um, extrapolate that into the world because it allows us to function and it allows us to do things and manipulate stuff around us. But that doesn't mean that... Um, the meaning itself is is anywhere except in between the synapses of our neurons. You know what I mean? Um, I think things just are, and I think that it's it's people that I meet in my life that touch my life that have a sort of implicit understanding uh, of that situation and an acceptance of that situation. I don't even think that they would know that they have it, but I can tell that they have it. I th I think. Masumi, my wife, is a person like that. She, um, I don't know if it's because she comes from Japan or just because of she's a really spectacular artist, or I, I don't know what it is, but she, she, I don't think she really. I mean, when I talk to her about these things, she she entertains it and she'll have the conversation with me. But it's it's she she I think she sees the futility of a lot of these things and. Is she's sort of amused by it. You know what I mean? It's like, it's as though, uh, it's as though the best answer that I'm ever going to come up with is going to be manufactured by my own brain anyway. And, and you, 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 do you know what I mean? It's, I, th I think at the end of the day, there's a certain sort of um, necessity to acceptance. And the mark of a, of a mature person or a mature artist or whatever is someone who has reached that. And, and, that, and that has, that's a multiple layered thing, you know, acceptance of, of your ability, acceptance of, 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 of where and when you are and, and how far your art can reach out to other people or can't, and acceptance of, of what you think it means and, and is that translatable to other people. Um, there's all sorts of different uh, 
directions. And I think acceptance is the key to uh, finding um, I don't know, happiness, that's not really the right word, but finding, uh, maybe finding value, maybe I'd, I'd be comfortable with saying that, you know, I think that um, just like we have to, I mean, like my, my friend that's got ALS, he, he has, to, the only thing he can, the only thing he can do is to come to an acceptance of having it. I mean, that's literally the only thing he can do now, you know, except push himself with a little knob and a wheelchair around this room that he's never going to leave. And he knows that. And we talk about that. So it's very poignant, you know, it's like, yeah, acceptance. But that can be a tough pill to swallow. I mean, it certainly has been in my life. There's a lot of things I've experienced and done that I don't want to accept. And you just, you, we, we have to, we have to learn how to do that. And, you know, I'm getting better at it. Yeah. <laughs> in my old age, I'm getting better at it. You feel like that um, working with some of these ideas and like with the cataclysms that, is part of you sort of processing that acceptance of what's out of control, you know? Yeah, that's a good way to put it. Um, I think so. I, I think so. I think so. And I, and I like how um, if you look at something like making a drawing, for instance, that, that can be understood as an exercise in control. Um, the way that I draw is I usually find or manipulate images uh, in the computer and then I grid it out and I, however big I want to extrapolate it, I grid that out and then I just draw from there, I, I transfer it, you know? And so that process, when I'm actually making the drawing, there's not a lot of creativity, you know? There's just basically tones of gray that, I'm, that are next to each other and does this one push or pull? I mean, it's almost a very simple methodical exercise that doesn't, uh, you know what I mean? It's not what it's not the way that I think most people think of making art as very expressive and creative and, and juices flowing and all this stuff. I mean, yeah, I guess there's that at the beginning, but when you're actually executing a drawing that takes two months to make because it's like hyper realistic, you're not thinking about all that nonsense. You're just it's just tones next to each other. You know what yeah. I mean? You're just like evaluating is this is this right or not? And and so it's a really different kind of process. Um but I find it I find it very meditative and and calming to 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 draw. Uh, I'm very I'm very uh, grateful that that is something that uh, that I'm able to do. Uh, you know, that's not the way that everybody makes art, but I um, I, I like that aspect of it. Um, yeah, I, I I find that as well. It's interesting you said like that when you're kind of in that space that you're you're not thinking about like that other nonsense, which is <laughs> in a way similar to what your neighbor was saying to you. Yeah, 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 isn't it? Isn't it? Yeah, <laughs> like, like when I'm in there, nice I'm, doing, I'm doing my job yeah. and you're yeah, nice one. in a way saying- That's very well put. <laughs> um, it's just getting a lot, getting- That's very well put. Lost in it and- um, and what's in what's in front of you and being present with that you know it's yeah. like there's absolute value in asking the kind of questions and 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 doing the kind of exploration that you're doing and i'm doing as well and a lot of other people um whether it's in an artistic creative way or a scientific way or whatever you know there's absolute value in in having those bigger picture um you know conversations and then those lead to understandings that can change our our world view and our view of ourselves you know that's not a small thing and like i i absolutely in no way want to diminish that um like, I actually think the opposite, like we should be doing more of that. No, I, and, I, and I agree with everything you've said, but at the same time, one, one's, in, one's intention. But also I think one's, if, if one's intention is very important with making, uh, making art, you know what I mean? Or, or whatever. I think that if the intention is misguided, then it can really sully the whole affair. And I, I guess what I mean by that is um, 
something that 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 I'm trying to um, really employ in my life is is letting go of expectations. Mm -hmm. And I was talking to an, an artist friend of this the other day, and I said, um, I told him I'm trying to do that, and he's like, Yeah, well, have expectations if you want to be disappointed. You know what I mean? So it it's hard. It's hard not to to make art or music or or write something that's creative and and do it without expectations that's a difficult thing to do and that's a mark of a really mature creator that can do that you know what i mean um i mean we all i, I don't know I, i've my whole life i've had these fantasies of if i get this show or if i get into this competition or if i do this or that and invariably if i get it and i get in the show or i get in the competition immediately i'm like oh well Anybody could have done that, but what's the next thing? You know what I mean? I, I dismiss it because I achieved it. I really, I really want to get rid of that type of thinking. I, I just, I have to be conscious about that's misguided thinking from the beginning. And the thing that, that gives value to what I'm doing is the doing it. It's the creating of it. It's the making of the drawing. It's not where it's going to hang someday. It's the actual time spent making it. That's the value. And back to Masumi is, I, I think that she just implicitly understands that in her practice. I've always been really um, impressed by, by that, you know, in her, in her uh, I guess it's a, it's a point of view more than anything else. Um, yeah. Yeah, I, all of that completely tracks, you know, um, I feel like I get a little impatient sometimes while I'm I'm in in the painting part of it and only with certain stages it's just kind of like there's parts that I enjoy less than other parts and when I'm in that moment I'm just kind of like let's hurry it along you know um mm -hmm. yeah and wanting it to, and because I, I tend to work in series, like I want it, I want to have them, you know, done and I want to be able to look at them all together. And, yeah, and, and part of the process for me is that like, you know, while I'm doing it, it's kind of like that, that presence in the moment and with the materials and whatever I'm working on. Um, but, but there's also like a revealing that happens, uh, like it's a process of discovery that I don't always really understand what that's going to be until it's finished. And I look at it and I'm like, oh, well now that explains like X, Y, Z and all these other things in my life that I couldn't understand. But as soon as I see it in the form of this painting, I get it now. Do yeah, but I, 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 I think that I think that every I think you have to have a strong structural uh, methodology in place to allow that to happen. I yeah. completely agree with you that when those things happen, they're 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 really um, they can be changing. They can be um, like epiphanies. You know what I mean? But in my own case, I have to put in the hours and the discipline and the quiet time of studio practice to allow those things to take place. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Um, and they, and they, they sometimes do, they sometimes don't, I don't know, you know, everybody ebbs and flows in their, uh, in their understanding of what they're doing, I think, you know what I mean? And the value of what's happening. Um, I, I really do like, um, being able to sort of uh, perform musically and also create visual art at the same time, because it's, there's, there's sort of um, two sides of the same coin, but in, in, in very different ways, you know, I mean, when, when you're, when you're playing music, you're and improvising, you're, you have to hold on to certain things, what's being played along with you with other musicians and, and what is in your capacity to play on the instrument and, and what is the room hold and and you know what i mean all these different factors go into it but yet you're, you're you're there and if you're prepared you can you can take it where it where it wants to go even though that's uncharted i think the same thing happens in visual art just like you expressed it um, yeah. yeah do you um i was listening to some of your music on soundcloud it's really nice 
Um, oh, thanks. Do you feel like, um, are those two creative processes, like, are, I'm not a musician, so I don't, I, I do write, and there's other aspects of creativity that are, you know, they require kind of, it's not that they require, they trigger a different uh, hmm. function in my brain. Um, and yet they still, they still kind of can flow back and forth with each other. Do you find that uh, creating music and creating visual art is there a separation there or is, are those lines blurry for you? How does that work for you? Uh, yeah, there's a, the separate, the biggest separation is that, um, I mean, I have performed solo stuff before, but what really I enjoy playing with, with, um, two or three other people in a, in a small ensemble. Mm -hmm. And I think that that is something that I, I've never really collaborated, uh, in visual art. I maybe, once 30 years ago with someone, but um, I find that to be a pretty solo uh, enterprise. And I feel like, um, I mean, one work with a gallerist and, and that's a type of um, collaboration, but that's a little bit different. You know what I mean? That's more like a promoter. Uh, so I think that there's something um, that's more intrinsically collaborative in making music. And I, and I really do love that uh, quite a bit. Um, but I think that I'm most comfortable uh, creating visual art in, in a solo situation. Uh, I guess that would be the biggest uh, difference between the two things. I, I think that there's a certain part of the brain that's engaged, which is which is probably uh, similar to both enterprises. Um, and also, when 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 um, writing something, you know, uh, it's kind of like a trance state. I guess is what we're talking about. You know, people call it a flow or a um, or whatever, but you're, you know, you're in that spot where you can be driving along the highway for two hours listening to a podcast, and you you haven't thought about driving once. You're just so engaged in this other thing, but yet you're you're driving. You know, you're. <laughs> um, it's kind of that that flow that is the enviable place to be. Uh, however, you get there. Yeah. 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 Um, can I ask you about Phil Spectral? Is uh huh. Name is that like at the name of a band, or is that just you solo, or like? Uh... Uh, that's a that's a project that I put together a little while ago, and um, it's mostly been a, a quartet. Um, I came up I came upon that name. Uh, I was I was really influenced by Phil Spector and his way of producing. You know, he came up with the wall of sound. Um, in the early 60s, he was a, a very interesting and, and, and uh, tragic figure in music. Um, he was he was he was a very troubled individual, and he uh, created a lot of trauma for a lot of people in his life. But I I find that um, I just find that sound that he came up with. I mean, he would he would he would have like five pianos going, uh, playing the same thing at the same time in the in the studio, and he would do that with different instruments and different drum kits, and it would just create this enveloping, shimmering sort of uh, uh, presence. I don't know how to describe it. You know, it's very unique, and I don't think anybody is really, certainly in pop music, has come up with anything quite like that. And so that that was the reason behind the name of it. Uh, it's it's I've I've just been heavily influenced by the improvised music scene in, in Houston. Uh, I didn't really make music before the quarantine um and so i got involved in that kind of scene and it's been a huge impact on how i think about music and how i think about playing um uh yeah i don't know um i don't know if that project is is gonna maybe maybe we'll do a release or two or something else but you know those things have a have a, have a half-life too and you and you kind of uh you ride them for where they take you and then and then try to be open to other things as well yeah yeah i just um i kind of tuned in to i mean i don't know that much about him other than i know of the you know the controversy and the 
Yeah, I mean he he was a gun nut. He he he, he was a gun nut, and he yeah. ended up um, unfortunately shooting a woman in his home. And uh, then he it was a big trial, and he went to prison, and he ended up dying of COVID in prison. Um, but he 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 was a very uh, he was a very very demure body type person. He was a very small individual, and I think he had a, a complex about that from an early age, and perhaps toting around a gun made him feel powerful or something. I, I don't know. It's a fascinating uh, biography on him that I would recommend to anybody. Uh, Mick Jones, I believe, is the is the English uh, rock historian that wrote it. Really, really good book. Um, he's just he's a very sad. A very sad uh, individual, but um, yeah. I don't know. I find a lot of um, interest in, in tragic figures in history. You know what I mean? Yeah, that's kind of where I was. I was going with that with some of the other themes in your work, um, and then just the complexity of of human beings who. Um, you know, are on the, I, I I hate to like put it in terms of like sides, but on the, you know, the, the people who end up like hurting other people. Mm -hmm. um, and, and our tendency to compartmentalize that into good person, bad person, evil, not evil. Yeah. You know, and there's so much more going on. And, and I'm being really, really careful saying this because I in no way want to convey the idea that um, people should not be held accountable um, and that there are not, there are, yeah, I don't want to be too relativistic about it, I guess. Yeah. You know? You know, it's it's funny that it's funny you're bringing this up. So, um, just maybe a couple of weeks ago, a musician that's that I play with sometimes, and just somebody on the scene, asked me why I why I named the project that, and they felt like it was a misogynistic uh, move. And I had never, I never, it never even occurred to me that that could be interpreted as misogynistic. Um, but but once they explained it to me, I guess I could see that point of view. I, I certainly did not mean that. Um, Yes, he he was convicted of of, of shooting a woman, um, and it's a, a horrible, awful, completely horrible thing. Uh, I was not meaning to glorify that at all. I mean, if anybody knows me, you, you, I think they would they would understand that. Um, but it opened my eyes that 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 interpretations can be different. You know what I mean? Um, yeah. I don't think I'm going to change the name of the project, but at the same time. I think it taught me a little something that yeah. I didn't know before. And, um, but yeah, people, you know, there are no all good people. There's no all bad people. Um, there are life choices that happen on an incremental basis and we try to do the best we can. And I've certainly been at points in my life where I've made a whole bunch of bad decisions and, um, you know, maybe not always learn from them. Uh, but I think that, um, you know, I, I'm, I don't know. I'm trying to, uh, I'm trying to learn from everything now, I guess is, you know what I mean? I'm trying to, uh, understand how the experiences that we, that we've been through and the experiences that we create make us who we are at this moment. And there's a certain sort of, uh, mm -hmm. You know, there's a certain sort of reflection that should be evident in one's behavior uh, or in my behavior, you know, and it's easier not to, to think about that. It's easier just to go and, and do, but, um, yeah, you know, it pays to, dividends to be reflective. Yeah. I mean, I think just it's extremely healthy that someone gave you uh, feedback that a project you were working on felt misogynistic to them and you received it in the way that you did rather than to dismiss or attack that person which is what oh, a no 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 but do yeah I mean, so i mean i i i'm not bringing that up and 
in any way to like try to put you on the spot. It's just that, oh, no, no, no. Uh, you know, I, I see it as, um, as being another kind of finger on this hand that you're working with of, um, of trauma and tragedy and how mm. the impacts that that has on people at an individual yeah. level, collectively, you know, whether it's, yeah, that's interesting. Not, I, you know, I guess that is kind of what I'm doing, you know, it's, it's, I haven't really, I don't know. That's interesting. I haven't heard it put that way before. And I, I think that that's something for me to really think about. Um, because yeah, I find that the, today, you know, as a 52 year old, um, I don't know, maybe it's because I have also have a son that's 13, right? And um, 13 is a really interesting age. Uh, you're you're not a boy anymore. You're not quite an adult, but I mean, my kid has this adult body and he's, you know what I mean? He's a man. I look at him, he's like a man, but he's not a man. And I, I reflect on when I was that age and I started, I just kind of went down a, a real negative path, you know, around 13, 14. And, um, and I don't want him to do that. You know, I don't want him to go down a similar path. Uh, and so I'm extremely vigilant as to trying to be a part of his life and, you know, maybe, maybe a little hyper vigilant and, and in certain ways, um, I don't know. I just feel real lucky. You know, I feel real lucky to have a healthy, happy kid and some stability in my life right now. I've gone through a lot of times when I didn't have much stability and that can be, um, I don't know. That can also be a way of growth. You know, yeah. that can also be a way that a person can be challenged and come through it on, uh, on the better on the other side of it. But Certainly, that's a younger that word game. Really, <laughs> I mean, I, I, I actually feel like I've been working with that in my personal life of what, what does stability mean? You know, like from the outside, yeah. um, is it just like financially having the resources that you need to take care of daily life? is it just something on the inside where it's emotional stability and your ability to like roll with the punches and, you yeah. know, um, back to acceptance, right? Yeah, exactly. Like there's been a lot yeah. of stuff in my, my personal life around that, those particular themes and a lot of learning. And I really think that it just is coming back to that place of acceptance and like, you know, I'm okay on the inside my my relationship with my kids is is great you know yeah um but it but from an outsider's perspective the way my life is arranged right now would probably look pretty messy you know mm. but um but it's also like afforded me some opportunities that i would have never ever chosen like spending quality time with my parents that I'm absolutely never ever gonna regret you know like some someday when they're not around I'm gonna have that and I'm yeah. gonna have peace like knowing that we were in a good place you know yeah that's good that's so really important it is and it's and really important it's taken me certainly taken me a while and you know to get come around to that uh, to that place of acceptance and, and being able to view it in that way. Um, yeah. and I feel like, you know, just to go back to, to what you were talking about before, just like these I always use the word like catalytic rather than cataclysm. Cause it's not, cataclysmic. <laughs> yeah, it's not always like, yeah. A, a horrific event sometimes yeah. it's just a shocking change you know um getting the rug pulled out from under you in some way that forces you to to kind of grapple with some of those those bigger questions in in life and then in you know our own personal lives 
I, I feel like in so many ways, that's where, that's where most people are these days, you know? Yeah. Um, the world has been changing very dramatically and we've all had to adapt and pivot and evaluate, you know, what, what matters and where, where are we and are we okay at, the, at our core, even if on the outside, it doesn't, it might feel a little wobbly, you know? I think it also, we have to accept, a, um, we only have a certain sphere of influence in our agency, you know what I mean? And to be okay with that and to understand that that still has meaning, even though I can't change the entire trajectory of the way politics is going in this country, I can still, you know what I mean? It's, it, there's a certain, well, I guess it comes back again to acceptance of, of, of this is where I am, this is when I am, and, and this is, you know what I mean? Just to be able to say, and this is enough, that, that, yeah. that's, that's something. That's yeah. Something. And I do want to add, just because I've, I've had this conversation, or I've had a conversation with some people in the past who that word acceptance is very triggering. Um, and it's because the, the, they happen to be in the throes of, uh, being affected by some of like, you know, the politics or, or other, you know, big things that have very real repercussions on people's lives. And so the idea yeah. of like, well, this is the way it is. You need to accept this reality that's a different message than what like you and I, that's a different way of it, it is heard. And I, I absolutely, you know, want to make sure that like, that's clear that yeah, I, you're I mean, advocating for that. I know I'm not advocating for that. Like if something's, you know, keeping people from being <laughs> able to live their lives fully, then they need to, that needs to be addressed in the moment, you know, it does. And th there almost needs to be a different word for, you know what I mean? Yeah. There's a distinction between a one one side of what we're talking about and the other side of what we're talking about. Um, I don't I don't mean that everyone should acquiesce to 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 un, unfair situations that they're confronted with, you know. Um, yeah, it's it's difficult. I, I think that. Um, well, I don't know. You, you're pretty eloquent in the way you just said it. I don't. I don't know if there's much more to add to that. So, yeah. Um, I, I know that if I'm to attain any sort of inner peace in my own life, you know, um, I. I guess I can look at acceptance as a starting point rather than an ending point. And if I look at acceptance as a starting point in my own life, then I'm able to more clearly figure out different paths to take from there. Yeah. If my starting point is one of conflict and, and disappointment and, and whatever, then, then, then I'm very much unable to, to make any sort of lucid decisions. Maybe that's a little bit closer to what I'm trying to talk about. You yeah. know what I mean? Is, um, yeah, I don't know. I like and, and a lot of and a lot of what's happening in society is we're, we're trying to create situations where people have more acceptable starting places. And I'm, I'm all for that. Everybody's all for that. You know, that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I maybe it being a starting place. Um, yeah. That works in all scenarios. Uh, is there anything else that you would like to, to talk about that we have uh, or that you want to, you know, expand on? Well, I would like to say, I mean, I would like to thank you for, for talking with me. And I, and I would like to say that I feel really um, fortunate to be, to be in Houston, you know, and to be a part of the art scene and the music scene, both of those things. Um, I just, I feel like there's a lot of, um, a lot of wonderful people that are involved in, in both of those scenes. And I just, I can't tell you how much richer my life has become uh, meeting all those people. You know, and, and being able to call those people my friends, I just, I just, I'm, I feel really fortunate. Yeah. 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 That's nice. I feel like that um, Houston is the one Texas city that I just haven't 
haven't dipped my toe into enough, you know, and mm. I don't really know what the reason is for that. I mean, part of it is I just, I don't really know anyone there. Another part is that in the summers when, you know, in the past I've had more opportunity to just kind of go and do stuff. The weather turns me off. Um, yeah. So there's that, but, but I just, yeah, I, I, there is a really rich culture there. Um, and not, not like a monoculture. It's, there's just, there's a lot going on that yeah. is very appealing. And I, I really hope to get to explore a little bit more at some point. So, um, I'm glad that we able were able to connect and, you know, that's kind of a, a little um, bit of an inroad there. So. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I'm also really interested in, um, you know, I have, I feel like I have pretty strong communities in in the Dallas, Fort Worth, Denton area and in Austin and oddly less so in San Antonio which is where I am now and where I'm from, but I, I was gone for long enough that I just like kind of lost contact. Um, but I'm all of those, it all feels very separate in a lot of ways. And I'm, I'm kind of interested in trying to weave some, some of that together, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, I've definitely had the experience of, you know some of the people that I know in Austin and some of the people I know in Dallas mm -hmm. feeling like though they need to connect and I'm sure I'm that the same is true in Houston so that's kind of one of my hopes for this project is that it you know not that it's I don't intend for it to be Texas artists exclusively but um especially starting out I think it's going to be a lot of that and just making some of those inroads and allowing people to kind of get to know each other on a more personal level is, is part of it. So thank you. Yeah. I'm looking forward to, to seeing the other interviews as well. I, I appreciate you letting me be a part of this. Yeah. And there you go. All the answers to life, the universe and everything. Maybe it's 42, maybe something else. Um, Thanks to Garland. Thanks to all of you. And um, I didn't say it at the beginning, but uh, your help with supporting this this little experiment by liking the video and subscribing to the channel goes a, a long, long way um, with boosting us in the algorithm and getting this out there. And um, comments are definitely welcome as well. Um, yeah, I hope that, I hope everybody, you know, I hope that reached some, something in people. Um, the next person coming up is Kenneth Holland. He's an artist out of Oakland, California. We have conversations about life in a very different way and, um, he's great. Like I've just, I've been a fan for a long time. Um, he's doing some really cool stuff lately where he's actually using Instagram reels and stories as like an art form, uh, which I don't really see a lot of out there. And um, rather than try to summarize it all for you right now, I'm just going to let this play out with one of those reels and hopefully you'll be tuning in then in a couple of weeks when that video goes live. Thanks everybody. I went home, I went to library and I lived for two years. I've been with you only five days. I swear, I went home and I found out all the things that had been bothering me. Why did they burn everything? They was mad. But you were just little children. I know. What did he care? They didn't care. Hey, now. Is my mic still on? It's on. And this song is called Backlash.
Alcoholics and addicts sleeping on mattresses. The big homie got clean, now he's an activist. The turpers gonna turp to this, they gonna gig. This is high frequency, this ain't mid. 